thank you everybody. It sounds like you guys have all had a wonderful day of information. Um, it is mid afternoon here in Denver. Um, so thank you for everybody who's in the UK and around the world, uh, staying up late to listen to the rest of the talk. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about Waldenstrom's and dermatology and the dermatologic effects of both the disease and the treatment. Um, we'll have about 10 minutes at the end again for questions and a lot of those have already been submitted. Um, just as a little disclaimer, I am not a dermatology specialist. I work with uh, very many WM patients here with Dr. Mattis. Um, so if there's questions after my talk that or issues that arise, I will give you my email at the end for further information should you need that. Uh, here's just a list of the objectives of some of the things that we'll be talking about here today in the next half hour. Uh, just a quick overview of WM, just so I make sure that I know that we're not all on the same page as to our understanding of the disease. Some of you are newly diagnosed. Some of you have been um, treated and going through this for many years. <clears throat> so WM is uh, the IgM protein that is overproduced. We usually check this through a set of labs called the quantitative immunoglobulins, as well as an M spike. As Dr. Dasas showed you, the IgM molecule is quite large, and so it is notorious for infiltrating many things, including the skin. Because of the size of the molecule, it can also cause other complications, which we'll go over um, in the further slides with skin disorders. The three classifications of WM that we see are IgM MGUS, smoldering, and symptomatic WM. Uh, various treatments that are necessary to treat symptomatic WM can also cause skin, hair, and nail changes. So just another picture on the right there, um, Dr. Dasa's picture was a lot better than this one, um, is the large molecule of the IgM, and this is why it causes so many issues. So the IgM levels don't necessarily give you all the information about how symptomatic a patient can be. If patients have a large, um, a high IgM level, they can have very few symptoms and vice versa. If they have low IgM levels, they can have a lot of symptoms. And so we can't always, we don't treat the number, we treat the symptoms. Here is a list of the various dermatologic conditions, both treatment-related and disease-related. You can see there on the left, uh, treatment-related conditions that we see often are brittle and cracking nails, corkscrew-like hair changes, skin infections, bruising and bleeding, psoriasis, post-rituxin, um, neutrophilic dermatosis, which is also called sweet syndrome, and neutrophilic eccrine hydrin hydratinitis. We'll discuss all of these um, both individ all individually in the upcoming slides. Disease-related conditions are pretty rare in WM. It's only about 5% of our patients. These can be anything from an infiltration of the LPL cells, hyperviscosity, purpura, Raynaud's phenomenon, levito reticularis, vasculitis, and chronic urticarial symptoms or Schnitzler's syndrome. Oh, let's see. Sorry, uh, I skipped an extra slide. Um, the disease-related conditions, again, these are rare in our WM patients. Um, there can be a neoplastic cause, which means that the skin is infiltrated with the LPL cells, and non-neoplastic, meaning it is caused from complications with the IgM protein. And we'll discuss all of these next. So here are just a couple of pictures. Um, on the left, you can see it's a before and after picture of um, LPL cells that have infiltrated the skin. This is before and after treatment. Um, these can range from a reddish brown to a purple with plaque-like texture. Um, treatment of these types of rash is really dependent on treating WM. 
when IgM infiltrates the skin on the right, you can see um, it's called cutaneous macroglobulinosis or bullous disease. And the one on the bottom right would um, require probably a wound care consult as well as um, oral antibiotics to treat potential infection. Sorry. Um, hyperviscosity with WM is common and can cause a, a few complications. Most of what we see are bleeding, edema, and headaches. This is when the blood becomes fairly thick, kind of sludge-like from the excess proteins. And um, because of the bleeding risk, we usually have our patients uh, have caution with brushing and flossing their teeth and blowing their nose because of severe nosebleeds. On occasion, uh, people do require hospitalization or emergency room visits to stop the bleeding from their nose. Um, for edema that can be caused from hyperviscosity, this is from the blood kind of infiltrating, being thick and infiltrating the tissue in the legs. And this can cause sometimes the skin to blister or weep. Things that you can do for this would be using compression socks, um, diuretics if that's indicated in your situation, which would um, decrease the fluid, elevating the legs, exercise um, we recommend for as tolerated, and then limiting any salt in the diet is helpful as well. Dr. Desa, um briefly mentioned cryoglobulinemia. This also, besides being associated with the neuropathy that she discussed, um, can also cause some dermatologic um, conditions that are associated with WM. This again is when the blood, when it is cold or at cool temperature, temperatures, it can clump or precipitate. And we'd use this, um, we test this through blood samples, which can be done at most um, clinics. The first thing that this can cause is purpura, which is these dark purple spots, which you can see in this picture. Uh, this is always on the extremities and sometimes can be painful when they're associated with the vessel being occluded. Uh, this can also be a result of hyperviscosity. Um, this is different, and there was a question that was submitted. This is different from petechiae in the size of it. So purpura are larger, can oftentimes be raised, and petechiae are smaller kind of pinprick um, red spots. These are both caused from breakage in the capillaries and blood leaking, essentially. Uh, sometimes we see this when people's platelets are low and with the bleeding risk with the BTK inhibitors like a brutinib or a calibrutinib, this can also be a risk. Raynaud's phenomenon is also in cold temperatures and is from a lack of blood flow. Uh, this can also be associated with cryoglobulinemia. It can cause what is um, termed acrocyanosis, which can be the discoloration there in the fingers. Um, it can be the fingers, the toes, the ears, and the tip of the nose. Usually the fingers will become white and then turn a purplish um, blue color from the lack of blood flow. When the blood flow returns, this is when they become a bright red color. This can be incredibly painful. Um, sometimes, or always what we recommend is keeping the hands and feet or whatever is affected as warm as you can with either gloves, socks, hand or feet warmers um, to help decrease the pain and to um, provide circulation to these extremities. Uh, two other conditions here listed are levita reticularis, which is on the left and is this web-like looking rash. This can be benign. It can be kind of transient, or for some people, it becomes more consistent and permanent. Uh, the cause of this is lack of blood flow in between the vessels. And so that's what causes the, uh, wider, area, the wider areas in between the web-like looking vessels. It can very rarely cause ulcers or skin eruptions in those areas of blood flow. And it's oftentimes not painful, but can be. On the right-hand side is vasculitis, which is inflammation or narrowing or blockage of the blood vessels. This can be quite painful. Uh, complications of this would be poor wound healing. Sometimes we see ulcerations associated with this. And um, on occasion, we do refer our patients over to the vascular specialist to help manage um, if, we're, if this is difficult to manage. 
and or wound care if we have poor wound healing. Uh, Schnitzler syndrome is a urticarial or severely itchy eruption. This is caused from white blood cells infiltrating the tissue. This is associated with the IgM protein and is more common in our patients who have IgM kappa WM versus IgM lambda. Uh, this is oftentimes associated with the itching and a constellation of symptoms you can see listed there. These would be fever, bone or joint pain, swollen lymph nodes, and neuropathy. This is pretty rare, but it is also underdiagnosed because it can mimic so many other things. Treatment really here is directed at treating WM and sometimes a medication called anakinra, which is another immunosuppressing medication to target interleukin-1. Um, this syndrome is often a diagnosis of exclusion, meaning multiple other things have been tested for either through biopsies, um, history and physical, speaking to a specialist, and um, nothing else has been found. So this is what's diagnosed. Um, this greatly affects people's quality of life because the severity of the itching can be so irritating that it can make some people feel kind of actually kind of crazy. Neutrophilic dermatosis, um, which is also called Sweet Syndrome, named after Robert Douglas Sweet, is characterized also, um, there's a constellation of things. So we need a clinical, clinical symptoms, a pathological diagnosis, and laboratory findings. Uh, patients will usually present with fever, tender or red skin lesions, and sometimes can affect areas outside of the skin, like the bones, the kidneys, the GI tract, the eyes, the central nervous system, and the heart. Um, labs show an increase in the neutrophils, which is a portion of the white blood cell when on any CBC, on any CBC it'll be in the differential. And when a biopsy is done, which is the pathology portion, the lesions show the infiltration of this portion of the white blood cell in the upper layer of the dermis. This can be, um, diagnosed in people who do have cancer diagnosis, as well as people without a malignancy. Um, the other things that this is common in is if they have a viral infection, some people in pregnancy or inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, treatment for this usually requires systemic steroids, sometimes topical steroids or an injection of a steroid into the lesions themselves. Um, other treatments would be potassium iodide and colchicine, which is typically used for gout. And then second line treatment is another gout medication called indomethacin. Uh, we have sometimes seen cyclosporin, which is an immune suppressing medication used and another medication called dapsone. Neutrophilic eccrine hydradenitis, <laughs> it's a mouthful, um, is a type of neutrophilic dermatosis that we just talked about. This, you can see the skin eruptions there in the picture. Uh, it's usually associated with chemotherapy and when chemotherapy stops, the rash goes away. It is um, what affects the sweat glands. And so it can make up most of the body, these type of sweat glands. And so you can have this type of rash anywhere. Um, it can appear infectious and some people do have fevers with this. It is definitively diagnosed by a skin biopsy and is generally self-limiting, although sometimes does require treatment with steroids, um, which would be used cautiously. Uh, other things that the skin biopsy would rule out would be if this was a viral infection, either bacterial or, um, sorry, an infection, either bacterial or viral. Um, and some people do need, if it's related to chemotherapy, they do need treatment before chemotherapy starts with Dapsone and then 14 days after the chemotherapy is done to prevent this from recurring. Uh, changes to the skin when WM is managed. There can be changes. Um, these are mostly related to treatment side effects. So if the, if the skin changes are from the WM, those generally get better um, as the disease is better controlled. Um, sometimes when we treat WM, we cause other problems with treatment related issues, which we'll go over next. Um, anytime there's question about 
what the rash or the skin con dermatolo dermatologic concern is from. Um, amyloidosis, again, is another thing that we worry about that can cause uh, poor wound healing. And any other skin issue, eczema, anything else, psoriasis that would be common that we would want to rule out before um, treating this. The epidermal growth factor receptor is responsible for the development and growth of new blood vessels as well as tissue. Abrutinib is intended to block BTK, the Bruton's tyrosine kinase, um, but it can also block this EGF receptor, which leads to several unintended side effects. These would be rash, bleeding and bruising, infections. Uh, these include skin as well as systemic infections atrial fibrillation and high blood pressure or hypertension. Um, sometimes dose modifications are required depending on the severity of the side effects. Uh, if there's uncontrolled bleeding, we oftentimes will hold the abrutinib for some time. Um, this always makes people nervous reasonably and can cause an IgM flare. Uh, sometimes we can resume at a lower dose and the bleeding will not recur. Um, we have stopped abrutinib for some of our patients with severe bruising without bleeding, uh, but that is usually rare. Skin infections, um, because the impact of WM on the immune system, our patients are at higher risk for having skin and systemic infections. Um, these are listed here. So some of the most common ones are a Staphylococcus aureus infection, this can be minor to very serious. It does require oral antibiotics. Uh, oftentimes this is termed cellulitis. And if left untreated could be in some cases life-threatening. Uh, we'll see oftentimes a redness, pain, swelling of the skin um, or fevers. Folliculitis is a more minor type of staph infection. This usually is along the hair follicle and does not always require treatment. Um, if treatment is required, we use a topical antibiotic, something like clindamycin um, to apply to the skin. Paniculitis is inflammation of the subcutaneous or fat or subcutaneous fat or adipose tissue. Um, this may require steroids again and or a lower dose of abrutinib or xanabrutinib, calabrutinib, um, whatever medication you're on. If there's a question about starting steroids, you always wanna talk with your provider because that can also uh, lower your immune system. So we just wanna make sure that these are being prescribed appropriately. Other skin infections include the herpes virus. This can be herpes simplex or zoster, which is the shingles infection. Uh, prevention of these, we oftentimes give acyclovir or valacyclovir, and we always recommend getting the Shingrix vaccine. If this isn't treated, especially shingles, if this is not treated um, promptly with, within about the first 48 hours, there can be prolonged post-herpetic neuralgia. So it can be um, nerve pain along the site where the rash is. And for some people that requires uh, pain medication. We've had some people hospitalized because of the severity of the pain. We have people who require gabapentin, Lyrica, and one of our anesthesiologists will do a nerve block at the site to stop pain that we can't get controlled by oral medications alone. The oral lesions that you see there um, are stomatitis or what's called aphthous ulcers. These um, oftentimes are not associated with an infection um, or with neutropenia, but can, be, can erupt from just a weakened immune system. Uh, we do treat these with uh, steroids, either systemic or an oral mouth rinse, as well as pain medication, um, both by pill form and topically in the mouth. Uh, sometimes a brutinib has to be held and the dose reduced if this continues to be severe. Uh, we have people who do require hospitalization because their nutrition is so poor due to the pain that we have to have them in the hospital for pain control in order for them to eat. So what do we do about these skin changes? Um, oftentimes these are most common in the first year of starting treatment, but they can really occur at any point in time. Uh, we've had a handful of patients who have been on abrutinib for years 
and start to develop side effects um, with five or six years into the treatment. Probably the most common complaint we hear about is the cracking around the fingers and the, the nails of the fingers and toes, um, keeping the hands and feet well moisturized with the uh, treatments listed there. Uh, one here in the States is called Mane and Tail Lotion. Uh, also another brand is Working Hands Lotion. Those seem to work really well. We recommend not using anything with fragrance or alcohol-based because those will be more drying to the skin. There has been some success with um, more brand name. Uh, there's a hydrosoluble nail lacquer called Genitor and then Nuvail, which is a polyurethane that can be applied. Biotin has been found to be effective in some studies. Uh, we always use caution with having thyroid tests done because it can give a falsely low TSH, which would present as hyperthyroid. Um, keeping any of the tissues that are cracked uh, clean, preventing infection. Uh, rash, uh, sometimes it's just a rash that's not bothersome and we monitor that. Depending on the severity, then treatment would be adjusted accordingly. And then hair changes. Uh, some people have thinning on uh, BTK inhibitors. I think oftentimes we mostly hear of people having corkscrew-like changes where the hair can get pretty curly. Um, we think this we don't know for sure what causes this, but there is some suspicion that because of the binding to what's called cysteine 481, um, that changes the protein in the hair and nails is what causes this to become more apparent in people being treated with the BTK inhibitors. Here's just some pictures of uh, skin changes and the nail changes that we see most common. Uh, these are classic for what we see on a daily basis, especially the nail changes. Um, they get cracked always, almost always at the corners of the nails. The nails lift. Keeping these filed um, and covered so that they're not catching on things is important um, just because of the pain that's associated with that. And then uh, the skin changes here are fairly mild. In rare cases, uh, people can get psoriasis after having rituxan. It's only about one in a thousand patients um, and can be reported any time during treatment. It generally resolves once the treatment with rituxan has stopped. Um, and this does sometimes require topical or systemic steroids. The cause is really unknown, but there is some suspicion that because we are suppressing the B cells, it would cause the T cells to activate and may be um, impaired maybe from impaired response to infection um, or from autoimmune changes. So the cause is not really known, uh, but it does look like classic psoriasis and can also be um, diagnosed with a dermatologist. Uh, when you're trying to manage all of these toxicities, whether it's from the treatment or the disease, uh, you always wanna talk with your provider, uh, your hematologist and or a dermatologist, we oftentimes will refer people out um, to dermatology to help with uh, diagnosis. And uh, we oftentimes are doing skin biopsies here in our clinic. Uh, if we need further assistance, the dermatologist can help us with that as well. There are many interventions that we have mentioned. Um, sometimes requiring treatment breaks or dose reductions is required. And we just take that on a case-by-case -case basis to see the severity of the side effects or the toxicities that are being caused. Um, and then just remembering when we do hold these treatments, especially for our WM patients, uh, there is the risk of the IgM flare, which can make people feel pretty miserable. Um, Flu-like, achy, fevers, uh, that does require steroids and then reinitiation of abrutinib usually helps. It doesn't mean that the disease is progressing, the IgM will bump up. Um, and once we get treatment reinitiated, we usually see that um, go back down to a more normal range and the symptoms resolve. Um, so thank you so much for attending. Uh, we have time now for some questions. Um, my email is my name, kate.mimkin, there on the slide, at health1, all one word, cares.com. So it's all spelled out, healthonecares.com. Uh, feel free to send questions for follow-up and I'll be happy to get back to you with some answers.
thank you, Kate. Um, and your your email address has come up in the, the chat line there. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Maureen, can we have some questions on the screen, please? Okay, Kate, so why did my hair get wavy since taking a brutinib? Not um, mine. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else's. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think this is, it's an about 25, 25 to 30% of people taking a brutinib. And we don't know for sure, but what the thought is, is binding to that protein, which I mentioned, which is uh, cysteine 481, which affects the protein in the hair and nails is kind of the what the conclusion is right now, although we're not a hundred percent sure. Okay. Thanks. Uh, somebody who takes a brutinib, what can I do for my splitting nails? I think you've covered that in uh, your presentation, but perhaps go over it again. Yeah. So the things that I listed in the presentation, um, I think that was on slide 20. Uh, other things are just keeping them filed, keeping them covered, really trying to prevent infection, um, not picking at the nails, um, keeping, so I think that just general hand hygiene, um, they can be incredibly bothersome. And so I think that, you know, we are oftentimes trying several things for patients to, if one thing doesn't work, we kind of move down the list of different lotions and things um, to see which would be most effective. Okay, thank you. Can a brutinib uh, cause tail, uh, sorry, toenail fungus? I have large white patches on my toenails. Um, we haven't seen specific cases reported with toe nail fungus specifically associated with a brutinib or that class of medications. I think probably what's more likely is that the immune system is weakened. And so you're more susceptible to having a fungal infection because either the medication weakened in the immune system or the WM itself, just by the nature of the disease. Okay, thank you. Uh, since my WM diagnosis, I've had issues with a huge amount of itchy skin tags. Does this happen with WM? No treatments yet, just on watch and wait or active monitoring. Um, I think that the, the itchy skin, the skin tag part, um, we don't, we have not seen here specifically related to WM. Um, itchy skin, yes. Just in general, without the skin tags, we do see with WM and that does get better with treatment. Um, and the wait and watch approach or the active surveillance is another way to put that, um, depending on the severity of it, um, would not necessarily be an indication to treat. Although if, uh, when treatment does start, if that's appropriate in the situation, uh, these symptoms most likely will get better. Yeah, and I think I mentioned to you before we came on air that, um, that's something I suffered from before diagnosis, um, and the treatment did did help me, um, in fact, it cured it. So, uh, but not reason, to, not reason to start treatment, as you say. Right. Uh, does WM predispose one to vulnerability to insect bites as well as increased reactivity to bites? We see this all the time with our CLL patients. Um, we don't see it, and Dr. Madison and I were talking about this. We haven't seen it really at all with our WM patients. Um, in, in our practice, but um, our other B cell lymphomas like CLL, it is very common to see this. I shouldn't say very common, it's more common. Uh, is there an increased risk of skin cancer with a brutinib? Uh, yes, there is. It's about uh, 20, roughly 20, 23% is what we're seeing um, in, the, in the literature. Um, these are usually non-melanoma type skin cancers, uh, which would be basal cell or squamous cell. Um, there is some preventative uh, nicotinamide, which is a vitamin B3 that has been studied to prevent um, worsening skin cancers, especially at people with higher risk. Um, but yes, we do see um, a brutinib causing a secondary skin cancer. I'd say it's more common in our CLL patients um, but certainly it's a class effect, I think, or a drug effect. Can I color or perm my hair during or after chemotherapy? Can I get a pedicure or manicure during chemotherapy? Uh, the answers are yes. Some people, when they're on chemotherapy, have a lot more skin sensitivity. So I would be cautious with the hair dyes. 
that it doesn't cause sores or rashes on the scalp. Um, as far as um, getting a pedicure or manicure, again, the biggest thing with anybody, especially you guys on treatment and with WM, would just be making sure that instruments are clean and strict infection control. When should a WMO consult an on oncological dermatologist? Um, I think most dermatologists are excellent at diagnosing most anything. So having a specific oncological dermatologist may not be available in some smaller cities and rural areas. So uh, a general dermatologist should be able to help um, wonderfully. Um, anytime we cut give a consult to a dermatologist after we would do a skin biopsy would be if there's a worrisome lesion or rash that looks concerning for cancer. Um, if we have kind of an indeterminate diagnosis from our pathologist that we would need a dermatologist to help us with further diagnosing a rash that's been persistent. Um, if there's an oncological dermatologist available to you, I think that um, you certainly could do that. But most um, hematology or centers treating WM should have the capability of doing a skin biopsy to initially diagnose a skin lesion or a rash and then refer um, on to a more dedicated dermatologist if that's needed. Uh, next question, please. Uh, when is a skin biopsy necessary? Um, I think again, if there's concern for, if there's a concerning lesion, if there's a persistent rash that's been difficult to treat or resistant to treatment, um, anytime there's something that looks concerning for a secondary malignancy, um, then we absolutely would do a skin biopsy. Thank you. Uh, next question. What is the difference between purpura and Petechia blood spots. I am taking a brutinib. Um, so that was the picture on slide 10 was the large uh, kind of bruise like bumps or areas that are the purpura and petechiae are small kind of pinprick red spots, um, both from capillary breakage, uh, whether that's from low platelet count or being on a brutinib and the bleeding risk on that class of medication. Uh, so mostly the difference is in size. Okay, thank you. Uh, I take a brutinib. Uh, what can I do for splitting nails? I think we've had that one. Um, oh, yeah, there we go. Oh, there was, <laughs> I think the next one is about one, yeah. tattoo. Is it okay to get a tattoo if I'm currently taking a brutinib? Um, there's definitely going to be a bleeding risk. So depending on the situation, um, holding the brutinib may be appropriate. Um, I, I don't think that there's a strict contraindication or reason to absolutely not get a tattoo. Um, of course, again, infection and making sure that everything is clean um, and the bleeding risk will be higher. Okay. Uh, can WM cause my skin to itch and what can I use for relief? Um, yes, we WM can cause the skin to itch. Um, gosh. Sometimes trying um, oral medication, there's one called Atarax or hydroxyzine is used for anti-itching. Um, not always effective for everybody. It can cause some drowsiness. So you have to use caution um, in our more elderly patients and using it during the day. Uh, we have had to prescribe Paxil, which can be helpful for some people and or sometimes gabapentin sometimes the itching, whether it's from the disease itself, sometimes um, nerve damage can feel like an itching sensation, which is unrelieved by scratching, uh, is when we would start involving some of these other medications like gabapentin, Paxil, Lyrica. Um, treating WM, uh, like Bob said, uh, improved and using topical anti-itch creams or antihistamines, Benadryl, Claritin, Zyrtec, um, any of those over-the-counter medications. Um, some people need multiple medications depending on the severity. 
uh, and it, it can be severe and really affect quality of life depending on how debilitating and bothersome the itching is. Okay. One of the side effects of ibrutinib is skin rash. Are there, are there over the counter medications that can help? I think you just, just covered that um, mostly. Yeah, yeah, topical stuff, sometimes oral antihistamines. On occasion, you know, changing the medication, changing the ibrutinib dose if depending on the severity. Um, next question, please. This one, I think, okay. Okay. Uh, do the dermatological problems related to WM and to treatment decrease or go away with time? Yes, they generally do. Once the disease is treated, um, they should get better. Thank you. And I think, uh, can WM cause cellulitis? Um, it can. I think with the, I mean, any of us are at risk for cellulitis with any break in the skin. Uh, WM patients do have a weaker immune system uh, by nature of the disease. So yes, the risk may be a little bit more prevalent for the WM patients, uh, just with the, and so treating this with oral antibiotics um, and prompt treatment is necessary. Can I ask you my question? What is, what is cellulitis? I don't know what it is. Um, infection or um, inflammation of the skin. So you'll see kind of the bright red. Um, usually if there's a scratch or a break in the skin, it becomes inflamed, red, swollen. There can be fevers associated with it. It can be quite tender. Um, yeah, so usually, usually it's a staphylococcus infection. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. well, I think that's all the prepared questions. Um, I, I think we've got a... I don't know if um, somebody can tell me if we've got a little bit more time left. With, with Kate? No? no. Okay. So, uh, Kate, thank you so much for that. Um, thank you. Um, it's been lovely hearing from you and uh, a really interesting subject. And there's lots of comments have come up uh, in the chat box. So um, I think you'll be getting a few emails. So thank you for your time tonight. That's great. I will get back to you all. Um, I'm going to turn it now over to Larissa Patacolia. 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 Sorry. Hadakiola, <laughs> um, who's going to do the recording on WM and fatigue. Hello, everyone. I'm so thrilled to be able to share with you today. And though this talk did not go as planned and I was unable to be with you live, I so appreciate this time. My name is Larissa Patakiola, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. And I'm going to talk with you today about cancer-related fatigue. I love this slide as I think it so perfectly illustrates cancer-related fatigue. And while this slide may be cute and funny, all of you can attest to the fact there is nothing particularly cute or funny about living with cancer-related fatigue. So what is the definition of cancer-related fatigue? Mastian and his colleagues tell us, cancer-related fatigue is a multifaceted, subjective, physiological state characterized by persistent, overwhelming exhaustion and a decreased capacity for physical and mental work. This is an old definition, but certainly nothing has changed about it. The National Comprehensive Cancer Network, NCCN, in 2018 tells us, cancer-related fatigue is a distressing, persistent, subjective sense of physical, emotional, and or cognitive tiredness or exhaustion related to cancer treatment that is not proportional to recent activity and interferes with usual functioning. In my work with patients, we often discuss that cancer-related fatigue is long-lasting, does not diminish after a good night's sleep or a restful half-hour break. It's different from the tiredness related to everyday stress. It feels all-encompassing and can be difficult to explain to family and friends who are not living with Waldenstrom's. There are other ways to describe cancer-related fatigue. Some of those are exhaustion, inadequate energy, being lethargic, listless, lack of energy, tired, worn out, weary, exhausted, malaise, feeling run down. I'm sure those of you in the audience can think about some other ways and other words to describe this as well. Patients have described cancer-related fatigue as being feeling tired or weak, 
feeling like your arms and legs are heavy, not wanting to do things, not being able to concentrate, feeling irritable, feeling slowed down. I imagine that many of you listening to this today might be able to identify with these definitions. What is the pervasiveness of cancer-related fatigue? I'm sure in your discussions with friends and family members and other people you know who have Waldenstrom's or other kinds of cancer, it may feel like everyone has cancer-related fatigue. And some studies actually show that almost everyone does have cancer-related fatigue. 80% of patients can experience cancer-related fatigue. Bauer, in her review of some of the studies, found that 30 to 60% of her patients reported moderate to severe fatigue during treatment. But we do know that everybody experiences even just a little. What causes Waldenstrom's related fatigue? Cancer related fatigue can be brought about by a combination of things cancer itself, side effects of cancer treatments like chemotherapy and immunotherapy depression or anxiety associated with having a chronic illness, or all of the above. We also know there are psychosocial factors that can cause cancer-related fatigue or can be related. We know there's a correlation between marital status and income. Those have been linked to cancer-related fatigue in some reports with unmarried patients who have a lower household income reporting higher levels of fatigue. This suggests that contextual factors the absence of a partner who can provide instrumental and emotional support may influence the experience of the symptom. And this was from Bauer in 2014. This slide illustrates all of the factors that can influence cancer-related fatigue. Again, just in summary, a direct cancer burden, cancer treatment burden, surgery, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, hormone therapy, other medications related to your cancer that the side effects might contribute to fatigue. The cancer and treatment psychosocial burden, some of the things we just talked about, depression, anxiety, sleep disruption, pain, expectancy, self-efficacy, cognitive problems, relationship problems, employment problems. Some of the other comorbid conditions we know that people have in addition to cancer, because we know cancer doesn't happen in a vacuum, people often have other health-related conditions, anemia, deconditioning, skeletal muscle wasting, thyroid disease, cardiovascular disease, pulmonary disease, renal disease, malnutrition, infection. All of these things can contribute to cancer-related fatigue. So when we look at this list, it's no wonder that so many of you are fatigued. This slide illustrates um, some of the things that were on this other slide that we looked at just in more plain language. Um, the buildup of toxic substances that are left in your body after the cells are killed by cancer, injury to normal cells, fever, if you have a fever, you're often more tired, infection, pain, dehydration, you have too little water in your body and you're feeling dehydrated. We often feel fatigued. Loss of appetite, not getting enough calories or nutrients, trouble sleeping, anemia, shortness of breath, inflammation. We know in the blood cancers, a rise in inflammatory markers correlate with levels of fatigue. So that's often one way that your doctor will be able to tell whether or not you're fatigued. The risk factors for fatigue, they're genetic factors their history of current levels of depression, treatment modality dependent, depending on what somebody, what kind of treatment someone's getting, whether or not someone's depressed, whether or not they have risk factors genetically that would make them more at risk for it. Sleep disturbance or pre-existing sleep, sleep, excuse me, dysregulation for people who have difficulty sleeping, which we'll talk about in a little bit. We'll talk about sleep hygiene and some ways to improve your sleep. Those can often contribute to better or worse levels of fatigue. Someone has an increased body mass index or pre-cancer inactivity that can also contribute to fatigue. Someone has a history of trauma. We carry around exhaustion, emotional, emotional exhaustion that we all carry around day to day in our baseline that contributes to how fatigued we are. If someone's got difficulty coping, you're having a hard time coping, coping excuse me, with your illness, um, feeling isolated, low levels of support. This gives somewhat of an explanation as to why some people experience and not others 
And this is still being studied, but we do know that these are risk factors that all influence it. So for those of you who are struggling with fatigue, what should I tell my healthcare provider about my fatigue? It can be hard to have a discussion sometimes with your providers about these kinds of things because we have very limited discussion with providers about the things that we need to talk with, so many of them that feel so important in the day-to-day -day or in a 15-minute visit. But if we go into our visits feeling prepared and we go in feeling like we can be very specific with our questions, that can really make a difference in how much your provider understands and what next steps can be to help with your fatigue. So before you go in to talk with a provider, think about things like, do you feel well enough in the morning when you wake up? Does your fatigue progress throughout the day? Do you nap unexpectedly or use excessive amounts of stimulants like caffeine or other energy drinks to complete your daily activities? Does your fatigue come on gradually or abruptly? Is it a daily occurrence or does it feel more intermittent or periodic? What makes it better? What makes it worse? How has your life changed because of your fatigue? And be specific. So in other words, instead of saying, I was so tired yesterday, think about saying, I could not work for three days. Is your fatigue mental or physical? Or is it both? There are a number of pharmacologic interventions that your physicians can look at when they're looking at whether or not they can target your fatigue. We'll talk about non-pharmacologic interventions in a little bit as well, but your doctor may think about these things to help you. And this is certainly one way they can target it. Corticosteroids, some of you know these already, I'm sure, dexamethasone, prednisone. You may be wondering, gosh, I'm already on these medications. Why is it that I don't feel any difference? But you may also be feeling a difference when you know when you've taken them and when you haven't, or when you have the dex crash. Psychostimulants, Ritalin, Adderall, growth factors antidepressants, treating the underlying medical condition. So we always want to rule out whether there's some underlying medical condition that may be not related to your cancer or that maybe is related to your cancer and rule that out first or to treat that first. And always, always consult with your physician or your healthcare provider. Certainly it's easy to look at the steroids list and think, gosh, maybe if I take a few more steroids, that'll help with my fatigue definitely not something we suggest. Always talk to your doctor about increasing or decreasing or thinking about these things before you make any changes. There are non-pharmacologic interventions for managing cancer-related fatigue as well. Some of those things are physical activity, yoga, exercise rehabilitation, OT and PT, massage therapy, mindfulness-based stress reduction or mindfulness, psychoeducation, restorative therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, bright white light therapy. We hear a lot about it that this time of the year, especially as the days get shorter and the lights get less. And a nutritional consultation. Look at target fatigue and all good reasons why it makes sense to have a team of people who are looking at your fatigue. Because if you think about it, all of these different interventions require usually a different level of specialty to help. So for physical therapy, we can think about an exercise physiologist. We have a wonderful exercise physiologist at Dana-Farber here, and many other institutions have them as well. OT and PT, um, if you do yoga, if you do massage therapy and you have a massage therapist, um, if you have a therapist in the community and you're doing MS, excuse me, MBSR with mindfulness-based stress reduction or cognitive behavioral therapy, restorative therapy, all of those things are things you can talk to a therapist about. Bright white light therapy, if you have a psychiatrist, that's something you can ask your psychiatrist about or your PCP. We'll talk about that a little bit about what that is and what recommendations we give for that. And a nutritional consultation. If you have a dietitian at your center, you have a um, nutritionist who you can meet with in the community, we suggest that as well because they all have very good tips too. So how can I manage Waldenstrom's related fatigue? So these are just some of the ways as we talked about earlier, exercise, eating healthfully, don't overdo things, avoid stress where possible, improve your sleep hygiene. So multi-layered, that's the take-home message here, is that being multi-layered of an approach is the best way to do this. 
But that said, all of these feel simplistic because none of these all work by themselves or sometimes even all together. It can be a long process to get all of these things to work. One of the questions we hear a lot when we talk about exercise is how can I exercise when I am so tired? We know that even just doing something is better than doing nothing. And so when we talk about exercise, we don't encourage people to run marathons. We don't even think about running a 5K. We think about walking up the street, walking to get your mail, parking the car a little further away from the grocery store, all those things that we hear, but there's a reason why we hear them because there's still things to add and there's still things that make a difference. We ask people to do your best to keep doing your current level of activity. Do some physical activity for three to five hours a week. That might help with cancer related fatigue. Again, we're not asking folks to run marathons. Walk daily if your healthcare provider says it's safe for you. Walking is one of the most basic of exercises that folks can do. Cheapest, don't need anything fancy, don't need any fancy equipment. You don't even really need good weather. Think about starting an exercise program that's appropriate for your treatment. Yoga or gentle stretching exercises might be helpful to include as part of an exercise program. We know that in some of the studies, exercise over yoga yoga over psychoeducation, all of it over nothing is helpful in reduction of fatigue. Something is better than nothing. You've heard me say that many times through the slide and there's a reason why we say it. Something is better than nothing. If you see an OT or a PT, these are some of the things that you can think about how they can be useful. And you may be wondering if getting an OT might be helpful if your doctor hasn't suggested that it's something that you can think about asking for. OTs can improve activities of daily living, getting dressed, taking a shower, cooking a meal. They can help you to plan your activities so you're able to do as many physical activities as possible without getting too tired. They can also suggest ways that you can save energy and help you practice using special equipment. PTs can improve your ability to move by helping you to build your strength and your balance. They can also help you to develop a safe exercise plan that works for you. OTs and PTs can help you stay motivated. They can help you set goals. They can also help you to keep track of your energy level and make changes to your exercise plan as needed. This time of the year is an especially poignant one to be able to think about this slide in the most, most places of the world. Fall is a beautiful time of the year. It's one of my favorite times of the year. If you're able to get outside, and we know that we feel good when we're outside for most of us, there's a reason for that. Research has shown that spending time in nature can offer physical and mental health benefits. Simply taking a short walk in the park, admiring your garden, watching birds in your backyard, sitting near the lake, all of these things are restorative. And even getting outside in its own right can make all the difference between you feeling a little bit tired and a lot tired. So let's talk about sleep. 30 to 75% of patients with cancer have sleep disturbances in our recent guidelines publication from the NCCN. In 2018, we looked at this same publication and we knew that yoga was something to have been shown to improve sleep outcomes by inducing relaxation. So yes, how you sleep matters. Um, we know that all of these ways that we're going to talk about here having to do with sleep hygiene all contribute not just yoga so if you can't do yoga don't worry um, all of these ways can improve your relaxation and therefore can improve your sleep so we say try to to get excuse me continuous sleep at night instead of taking naps during the day limit your naps to 15 to 20 minutes in the late morning or the early afternoon so that you're still sleeping through the night so the key is if you're going to nap nap earlier in the day not later towards the evening. Follow a bedtime routine. There's a reason when we're kids why following a bedtime routine is so important or why we have our kids try and do a routine before they go to bed, right? Because we want them to get good sleep. And that's true for us as adults as well. We ask people to avoid caffeine, alcohol, tobacco, anytime after six o'clock. All of those things are good to stay away from. And for some things like caffeine or coffee, tea, things that have larger amounts of caffeine, 
we say nothing after noon. Listening to music or reading before bedtime, those are things that can help you to relax. Some of these things though, it's important to think about what works for you. I have some patients sometimes who will say to me, I watch TV every night before I go to bed. That's the only thing that can help me to go to sleep. So some of these things fly in the face of traditional wisdom because traditionally we would say, don't turn the TV on. The light makes a big difference. But for people who know that this works for them, don't necessarily mess with what works. Try to go to bed at the same time every night, wake at the same time every day. It goes back to following a routine. It's a different kind of routine. If you notice changes in your sleep patterns, talk with your healthcare provider. Your healthcare provider, your physician, your social worker, your therapist, um, many of us talk with people on a regular basis about sleep hygiene and talk about ways to improve your sleep hygiene and making changes. So additional sleep hygiene recommendations. So limit the use of electronics, no phone, no TV to more than one hour before bedtime. And again, goes back to that previous slide when I was saying that for most people, we make these recommendations not to use this. If you are somebody who you know this doesn't impact your sleep, you don't necessarily need to rush out and make the change. If whatever you're listening to, that podcast or whatever it is that you're doing on your phone is helping you to fall asleep, by all means, keep doing it. Set limits on work obligations before bed. Anything that stimulates your mind or stimulates activity, we don't necessarily want you to be overusing your mind. It's usually where most people are finding that they're staying awake and having a hard time sleeping. Ensure your room is at a comfortable temperature. Oftentimes when the room is too hot or too cold, it makes it hard to sleep. Use your bedroom only for sleep or intimate activity. Try meditation or prayer during periods of wakefulness in the night. And go to another room if you've been awake for more than 20 minutes. We usually say if you've been awake for more than 20 minutes, Try another setting because what happens when you're in the same room for more than 20 minutes and you're struggling to stay awake and you're tossing and turning and you're looking at the clock, you start to develop an association with what it means to be awake. And so then your body starts to associate, oh, it's the bed. It must mean that I'm supposed to be awake, not asleep. How we eat makes a difference with cancer related fatigue. So if you meet with a nutritionist, nutritionist will tell you to eat small, well-balanced meals and snacks throughout the day. Aim to drink eight to 10 ounces of glasses of water every day. And again, talking with a clinical dietitian or nutritionist at your center might be helpful. Your healthcare provider can give you a referral to meet with a clinical dietitian. Dietary patterns that reduce inflammation, such as the Mediterranean diet, other plant-based diets appear tolerable to cancer survivors, and they themselves might reduce fatigue. We saw this in Inglis in 2019, which is a more recent study. Supplementation with ginseng, ginger, or probiotics might improve cancer survivors' energy levels. We saw that in the same study. What we would say though is, again, like with all of this, check with your provider before adding any of those things into your diet. Increased protein intake might help to preserve lean mass and body composition. We also know that it helps with fatigue. Body mass index, as we stated earlier, really has an impact on fatigue. And so the more we can preserve that lean mass and get our body mass down, um, we certainly can influence whether or not we're fatigued. This slide, again, is one that um, shows a variety of cancer-related fatigue nutrition factors. So involuntary weight gain, starting at the bottom right corner there, obesity, whether or not we have inflammatory, inflammatory markers in our blood, protein, whether we're taking increased protein needs, whether we have abnormal metabolism makes a difference. Anemia, B12 deficiencies, iron deficiencies, malnutrition. If we're not getting the food we need, if because of chemotherapy, we have too much vomiting, too much diarrhea, um, or other malnutrition needs. We're simply not hungry because we're depressed and we're not eating enough. Malabsorption, those things can all increase or can all influence cancer-related fatigue. So all things to ask your doctor about. So we also know that there are emotional and psychological manifestations of cancer-related fatigue. So how we feel makes a difference. So if we're depressed or we have anxiety, it takes a lot of energy. Fatigue is a significant 
symptom itself of depression. And anxiety takes a lot of work and anxiety can make us tired and fatigued just by virtue of the fact that our mind never stops spinning. Hopelessness or negative outcome expectancy is when we expect the worst, that can be tiring too. It can feel like a weight weighing us down. Some of the cognitive symptoms that are we experience sometimes when we're fatigued, we have impaired memory, inability to concentrate. Those are things that also can correlate with fatigue. Reduction in ability to participate in leisure activities makes a difference. Reduced capacity to sustain meaningful relationships and activities with your family, feeling demoralized or discouraged about dependency on others. All of these things are manifestation of fatigue. So many times people will come and we use, we hear the term and we use the term depression so often in society now. It used to be that it was very taboo to talk about and now we talk about it often. And most of the time you'll hear people say, oh, I'm so depressed or I feel so depressed. And really to be depressed, we need to look at these things. There's really a constellation of symptoms that make someone depressed. If you have pervasive feelings of worthlessness, hopelessness, or negative mood for more than two weeks, changes in eating, in other words, you're eating too much or you're eating too little, changes in sleep, you're eating too much or too little, withdrawal from friends and family, finding little or no pleasure in your activities that were once enjoyable, cognitive changes, loss of focus, short-term memory, and an inability to concentrate, suicidal or homicidal thoughts, all of these things are things that we think about when we're looking at whether or not somebody's depressed. To have all of these things together doesn't necessarily mean that you're depressed. If you had all of these things on the list, yes, we would think you were depressed, but you really need to have about five of these. So it's not just that one of these things or a couple of these things means that you're depressed. It's really five or more. And really over that period of more than two weeks. So what are some interventions for stress management? And again, we talk about stress management because the more relaxed we can be, the more we can reduce our stress levels, the more we know that impacts how fatigued we feel. So there are things like progressive muscle relaxation, mindfulness, yoga, hypnosis, cognitive behavioral therapy, counseling, biofeedback, support groups, online support. All of these things can make a difference in terms of how fatigued we feel. There are definitely mixed results about whether psychosocial interventions alone have an effect on fatigue, but we know that combined with other modalities, studies have shown that there has been a reduction or there is a reduction, a major reduction, in fact, in cancer-related fatigue. So before I had said that we would talk about bright white therapy, and that's a common thing you hear around this time of the year, or light therapy, right? That's another word for it. Bright white therapy is not something that you need a prescription for. It's not something that you need um, to do anything fancy for. You can actually get a white light box on Amazon. Um, if you're looking to get a light box, we ask that you follow um, the following recommendations. Fluorescent light, at home use. So look for something at home. You don't have to go someplace to do this. This is something you can set up at home in the morning when you first wake up for 30 to 90 minutes. It's traditionally used for mood disturbances and sleep disorders. The way that it works is it stimulates your hypothalamus, which regulates your circadian rhythms. And we know that some of the studies show that this really helps. The studies for this though are small and they're really only limited to patients at this point with breast cancer. So the question really still remains as to whether or not it might help you with Waldenstrom's, um, but it's worth a try. Cognitive behavioral therapy, for those of you who aren't familiar, it's a therapy that focuses on the link between thoughts, feelings, and the associated behaviors. Their cognitive strategies, reframing, finding evidence, looking at facts versus opinion, challenging dysfunctional thought patterns. Most of us have some dys dysfunctional thought patterns that we use in our everyday life. But when we challenge those and we find ways to recognize them and deal with them, that can really help. And behavioral strategies, some of the things that we talked about before, like the progressive muscle relaxation and yoga and some of the behavioral strategies that can reduce stress. A study in 2006, which is an old study, but still relevant, 60% of cancer patients who underwent CBT versus those who were waiting for an intervention 
notice that there was a reduction in their cancer-related fatigue. So what are other things that I can do? Track when you feel energized and when you feel exhausted and use that log to help you expend your energy when it makes the most sense. Look for patterns. And maybe consider taking your log in with you to the doctor or to your nutritionist or to the OT so that you can talk together about ways that make the most sense um, during the times when you have the most energy and the times that you have the least energy to make changes. Consider scheduling your exercise and your errands and your appointments for a time of the day when you're least tired. Ask for help from others, especially when you're feeling low energy. It's normal to feel fatigued from Waldenstrom's. Being realistic about your energy levels can provide a sense of empowerment and can help you to feel more encouraged throughout the week. Just knowing that this is normal can make a big difference. When you're not feeling up to task, try not to be too hard on yourself and hopefully feel empowered enough to let other people know that you're not feeling up to it so that you can conserve your energy for another time. When we talk about conserving energy, we look at something called spoon theory, which is my next slide. Spoon theory was coined by Christine Mizzardino in 2003 in an essay called The Spoon Theory. So the idea was that the spoons represent finite amounts of energy we each have throughout the day. All of us have a certain amount of spoons in our life. Those of us who don't have Weldenstrom's or another type of cancer may have more spoons. Each spoon is delegated to a specific activity. So the idea is, is that when we take spoons away, each of those things represent an activity that we've taken away. Some of this came about because Mir Mr. Dino's friend began watching her as she took her medication and asked what it was like to have lupus. This was uh, irrelevant, not to cancer, but to lupus, which is another um, fatigue causing illness. Mr. Dino grabbed the spoons from around the dinner where they sat and she gave her friend the handful of spoons she had gathered. And the spoons helped Mr. Dino to show that the way with people with a chronic illness, including Waldenstrom's, often start their days off with limited degrees of energy. The number of spoons her friend had was how much energy she had to spend throughout the day. As Mr. Dino's friend stated the different tasks she completed throughout the day, she took away a spoon for each activity. She took spoon after spoon until her friend only had one spoon left. Her friend then stated she was hungry, to which Mr. Dino replied that eating would use another spoon. If she were to cook, a spoon would be needed for cooking, and she would have to select her next move wisely to conserve her energy for the rest of the night. So hopefully those of you sitting out there can identify with spoon theory because it really does feel like every activity in our life, right down to eating, to cooking, to lifting the spoon to our mouth, represents yet another spoon. So the takeaways, I know we talked about a lot here in this last half hour. Cancer-related fatigue is real and pervasive. The causes are multifactorial and not been pointed to one specific cause. In some cases, the cause is unknown. Cancer-related fatigue impacts the majority of cancer patients undergoing treatment and or post-treatment. Management is often multi-layered, so not one cause and not one answer, unfortunately. A three-tiered approach, exercise, cognitive behavioral strategies, and nutritional focus, all tend to give the best results. And as always, engage your provider. You are not in this alone. We have a saying at Dana-Farber and we say it often, you are not in this alone. We want you to come to us with your questions, with your concerns, with your worries. And fatigue is one that we know is a big worry. Thank you again. I hope that these slides have been useful as you think about how best to work with your providers around the experience of living with fatigue. Take good care and I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day. Welcome back. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. We, uh, we appreciate you sticking with us and, uh, and viewing these wonderful presentations. Just as a reminder, all of our video presentations will be made available on demand at IWMF.com. Uh, and be sure to visit IWMF events uh, to, uh, to go ahead and register for tomorrow's sessions if you have not already. I look forward to seeing you there. Uh, and on behalf of the entire IWMF, Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Jeremy Dichter, the Director of Development and Communications for the IWMF. Wishing you all a wonderful afternoon, and we'll see you tomorrow.